Hey guys, Tom here again from SynthHacker.com and with the release of my new A to A sample pack, I thought I'd give you guys a full breakdown of my whole process of making them from start to finish. Just to give you some examples, I'll quickly show you some of my favorites from the pack and then we'll get into it. If you want to grab the 10 samples you just heard, you can actually download them free as part of the Synth Hacker Essentials Bundle, the link for which you can find in the description. We're going to start by first synthesizing our 808 with Serum, and then I'll cover some of the creative processing you can use to give your 808s your own unique character. So the waveform most commonly used for making an 808 is a sine wave, and while this was the starting point I used for many of the samples in the pack, I actually found myself gravitating more towards using a filtered square wave. The advantage of this is that you have more harmonic content to play around with straight away without sacrificing the full low end you'd also get from a sine wave. Now, whether you're planning on sequencing your 808 from Serum directly or from a sampler, it's important to make sure you have your voice inset to mono to avoid clashing notes. One of the most defining characteristics of an 808 is of course the kick-like punch at the start of the sound. For this, you can use either an envelope or an LFO in envelope mode to modulate the global pitch. Either is fine, but for this demonstration, we're gonna use an LFO, turn envelope mode on with a pluck-like shape and set our rate to around a bar in length. In the global tab, we can then set this LFO to modulate the master tune and play around with the modulation range. As you can hear, a shorter range produces more of a dull thud, whereas a higher range adds a snappier quality to the attack. We can also play around with the envelope shape itself to dial in the attack further. As a general rule, if you want an 808 to also function as your track's kick drum, I'd advise having a longer envelope to create a punchier quality. If instead you're planning to layer your 808 with a separate kick sample, a shorter, less punchy envelope will make mixing the two elements a little easier. One further way to alter the character of the transient is to use the same LFO envelope to modulate the filter cutoff frequency, adjusting the range to allow more or less high frequency content to pass through. Before moving on to the processing and other plugins I used, I'll quickly cover a few other optional steps. For a lot of the 808s in the pack, I use Serum's noise oscillator to layer in different textures. As you can hear, Serum comes with a decent selection of analog noise sources. Also worth bearing in mind though, is that Serum's noise oscillator is actually a high quality sampler, allowing you to use your own custom samples. I actually ended up using mostly my own hardware noise and granular textures that again, you can download and try free for yourself as part of my essentials bundle. By default, samples will loop and stay at the same pitch. You can, however, turn on one-shot mode and also key tracking if you want to make the noise change in pitch depending on the note you input. For a lot of the samples, I also used a separate envelope to add more of a transient noise texture with less sustain. For a few of the samples, I also tried out adding in a second oscillator, an octave above oscillator A. This was just a quick and easy way to both add harmonic interest and also add width to the sound with the unison amount.
As you can hear, adding a second oscillator without rooting it through the filter can add a high-end fizz to the sound, which can not only sound cool, but also be beneficial in making the bass notes more identifiable in a mix. Alternatively, for some of the samples, I also just rooted oscillator B through the same filter as oscillator A to create a thicker sound. The final synthesis technique I used for some samples was filter modulation. Let's first set up a separate envelope to modulate the filter cutoff, replacing the earlier used pitch LFO. Next, let's try turning up the filter's resonance. As you're probably well aware by now, resonance adds a very identifiable squelchy character and is very commonly used for bass sounds. The issue here, however, is because resonance works by creating a frequency peak around the cutoff position, the important low end frequencies of our 808 get attenuated. To remedy this, we can first use the same short envelope to modulate the resonance amount. Because the amount of resonance now rapidly decreases, there's much less of a frequency peak for most of the duration of the sound. This does mean, however, that there are still some low frequencies missing at the start of the sound, which we can also help to solve by introducing a sub oscillator. Because we've set the sub to direct out, it completely bypasses the filter, helping to fill in any gaps in the low frequencies. Setting the pitch envelope to the global pitch earlier on also means that the sub is perfectly in sync with oscillator A. Another option is to set the same envelope to modulate the drive of the filter, helping to add some punch to the transient of the sound. or even to modulate the filter's mix amount to let some high frequencies through at the start of the sound, add in a little bit of fizz. From here, with the structure of the sound set up, you can create different variations by playing with different waveforms, the pitch envelope, a modulation range, different filter types, noise sources, and so on. But one of the most effective ways you can put your own unique take on the sound is to use external processing. I'm gonna first run you through a bunch of the types of plugins I used when creating the samples, and then towards the end of the video, I'll also be showing you how I used frequency splitting to give me even greater control of the process. As you may have already noticed, we've been using a subtle amount of Ableton's limiter throughout the video to ensure we don't get any nasty digital peaking. I definitely recommend at least some light limiting at the end of your chain, especially now we're going to be playing with external plugins that can sometimes behave a little unpredictably, especially when cycling through different presets. I'd also recommend using some kind of pitch detection plugin like Ableton's Tuner, just to be 100% sure your sample stays in tune when experimenting with different effects. So the first type of processing I used on these 808s will probably come as no surprise, and that's saturation and distortion. I used this in a multitude of different ways, including a light amount of drive to subtly bring out harmonics, mainly gravitating towards Ableton's saturator or Sound Toys Decapitator for this purpose. For harsher and more experimental distortion, I'm still a huge fan of Isotope's Trash plugin. Whichever approach you prefer, distortion is useful not only as a creative effect, but also for squeezing more harmonics out of the sound to help reinforce the melody of your 808, even through less than ideal speakers. Another type of processing I've been obsessed with lately is downsampling and bit crushing. There's a ton of options out there for this, including Ableton's own device.
You could even use Serum's own downsampling distortion, but by far my favorite and go-to plugin for this is D16's plugin Decimart, which not only has all the functions you'd expect from a downsampling plugin, but at the risk of sounding cliche, also just has a really nice sound of its own. One of the reasons I think downsampling sounds so great on 808s is that the result is usually a higher frequency peak on an otherwise mostly low frequency sound, which acts as kind of this pseudo noise layer definitely worth experimenting with. One really simple but effective Ableton stock effect is erosion, which allows you to layer either a customizable noise sample or a pitched sine wave, which produces a similar effect to downsampling. There are, of course, plenty of other approaches and plugins out there when it comes to lo-fi processing. For example, all-in-one plugins like RC20, with which I used the noise module set to follow mode to add some texture for some of the samples. Just be aware that if you're planning on bouncing out your 808 as a sample for later use, a lot of lo-fi plugins by default can add unwanted consequences like pitch drift or low-end attenuation. Finally, the last main type of effect I had a lot of fun playing around with was cabinet and amplifier emulation plugins. These are of course commonly used effects for guitar or bass processing, simulating recording the output of a loudspeaker cabinet with a microphone. I actually used Ableton's own cabinet effect quite a bit for this, which gives you a few different cabinet types as well as mic placement options. If this is a sound you like, it might also be worth investing in third party options such as Native Instruments Guitar Rig. or one of my personal favorites, IK Multimedia's Amplitube. This type of processing not only offers an interesting alternative to in-the-box distortion, but also adds a sense of physicality to the sound. One issue with cabinet emulation is that naturally, when recording a loudspeaker through a microphone, there's a loss in lower frequencies. This leads us into a processing technique I use all throughout the making of the sample pack, which is frequency splitting. Simply put, this involves using an audio effect rack to duplicate the signal before then using an EQ to split them into different frequency ranges. This allows you more freedom to experiment with the higher frequencies of the sound while leaving the low end intact. Now, one common issue you may run into if using a basic EQ like Ableton's EQ3 is that because of the crossover frequency and phase relationship between the two layers, the output won't be identical to the input. Generally speaking, as long as the final result sounds good, this isn't a huge issue. Personally though, my favorite solution to this is to use Isotope's Ozone Stereo Imaging plugin. Because it's designed to allow you to change the width of specific frequency regions of a sound in a completely transparent manner, the sum of the different bands is identical to the original sound. From here, we can then play around with all of the processing we covered earlier, but do so with the freedom of not having to worry about losing the low end impact of our 808.
One thing to bear in mind is that you can also place the EQ at the end of the signal chain. This can drastically alter the sound as all of the low frequencies of the original signal are now being processed, but because we still have the EQ at the end of the chain, the frequency splitting will still take place and produce a clean sounding result. From here you can keep experimenting with different effects but it's also worth bearing in mind that once you have a processing chain you like it can also be fun to go back into the synth as even slightly adjusting parameters can now produce much more dramatic results. So there we have it. I know this was a longer video than usual, but hopefully this gave you everything you need to begin making your own 808 bass sounds from scratch, or even just gave you some creative ideas for processing 808 samples in general. As mentioned at the start of the video, I did recently release an 808 sample pack. You can check out at synthhacker.com, or if you wanna grab 10 808 samples to try for free, you can download my Synthhacker Essentials bundle using the link in the description. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below and to stay up to date with upcoming videos you can subscribe and click the notification bell. That's all for this one though guys, as always thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.